Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Unijoy channel. Today, we are going to be analyzing Spirit Phone. Spirit Phone is the seventh album made by American musician Neil Ciceriga, also known as Lemon Demon. Releasing in 2016, this was the first full-length Lemon Demon album in eight years. Since its release, a cult following has developed, with myself included. This video is going to focus on the lyricism and meaning of each song throughout the album. While lines can seem abstract and bizarre at times, the songs in this album are all held together by themes and messages Neil aims to share and which I intend to break down and analyse. So without further hesitation, let's get into the video. So the album opens with Lifetime Achievement Award. This song is about the increased usage and acceptance of reusing celebrities after death within the media industry. So for example, Carrie Fisher in the new Star Wars films, the Tupac hologram, and Kim Kardashian's dad, paid for by Kanye. The idea that companies can profit not only off of your death, but off of your reincarnated body, is a real thing that celebrities have to deal with, with many of them seeking posthumous protections. The title Lifetime Achievement Award is a play on the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, where those who achieve great success in the musical world are literally awarded a lifetime. The track opens with white noise in the background that can be found throughout the album, most notably at the end of Swire Levance, causing the whole record to loop perfectly. On the Spirit Phone commentary track, which I highly recommend watching if you want to know more about the album, Neil claims that the white noise is a ghost, introducing the running themes of paranormal activity and the supernatural. Throughout the song, there are heavy allusions to Michael Jackson and his death, and the over-commercialization of such. Releasing songs after so corporations can squeeze as much money as they can from Jackson's legacy. This is supported by the use of us, implying that there is some larger corporate entity behind all the revivals. During the chorus, Katy Perry is name dropped. This is in reference to a Graham Norton clip where Katy Perry talks about the long-standing conspiracy that Paul McCartney died and was replaced during 1966. The track comes to a close through a call and response that Neil created by putting his voice through a deep synthesizer. The origins of the lyrics are taken from the warning at the beginning of Michael Jackson's Thriller music video, which is 13 minutes long by the way. Now to give a little bit of context on why this disclaimer was shown, in 1982 there was a large pushback against extreme or inappropriate media, backed by groups such as the religious right, and supported by none other than Ronald fucking Reagan, who we'll get to later. It got to the point where people believed the occult was a legitimate threat to the children of America, and was the direct cause of an increase in teen suicide. During the recording of the music video, Jackson's religious value seeped in, being a Jehovah's Witness, and added this to clean his conscience from all the suicides that may spring up due to Thriller. This call and response is repeated three times over, sort of like Bloody Mary or Beetlejuice, once again playing into the supernatural themes. The second track is Touchstone Telephone, and one of my personal favourites. The song centres on a conspiracy theory, adamant that they've solved every big question and cover-up. All he has to do now is to tell someone. Believing that the only people who would take him seriously is this conspiracy-based radio station, he dials in and tries to spread his message, despite paranoia of being called crazy and having his life work discredited. He rambles on about how he is the right one, and how he's unlocked the truth, yet ultimately gets so caught up in his rant that he never gets to the point and shares his big finding. There are a bunch of references in the beginning of the song, so I'm just going to run through them quickly. Big Cat refers to the cryptid alien Big Cats, which are large cats, sort of like lions and cougars, which have been sighted in Britain of all places. Space Nazis refers to the conspiracy that the Nazis, post-defeat, escaped into space and Robert Stack hosted the TV show Unsolved Mysteries from 1987 to 2002, before his death in 2003. Leonard Nimoy famously played Spock in Star Trek, and was also the host of a paranormal TV show called In Search Of. The featuring of Stack and Nimoy can infer that the caller builds a lot of their theories from TV shows. Throughout the song, it's pretty heavily implied that the caller suffers from paranoia. Through the lines, If I can make it through tonight, everybody's gonna hear me out. The caller is seemingly plagued by his delusions of persecution, focused on high-up organizations like the CIA or the Illuminati silencing him. While absurd, this threat is real to him, which only goes to show how far into the delusion the caller has fallen, and why the radio host is the only person in the world who'd understand. Towards the end of the song, the tone shifts from nervous and erratic, to rambling a confident and demanding speech when faced with the threat of being disconnected from the call by the host claiming that they are the one and they've been right all along. Also, side note, UFOlogy is a real study, 
and that's one of the best names for anything literally ever. And finally, the Super Sargasso Sea, where the caller says he'll show up, is a fictional dimension in which lost things go, created by the author Charles Fort, a very famous catalogist of the paranormal. Also, in researching the Super Sargasso Sea, I discovered what I can only refer to as a master. The third track, Cabinet Man, is the most explicit with its story, and one that you've probably already picked up on yourself. The story follows a man who is obsessed with technology, that he goes insane and transfers his organs inside of an arcade machine, becoming the Cabinet Man. From then on he gets put inside of an arcade, where he supposedly sends children mad and eats a couple janitors. Eventually, when Christmas comes, the arcade is replaced by handheld devices, and left abandoned which is when some kids break in and bash up the cabinet man until they see his blood on their sneakers. This track is most likely about the arcade game Polybius and the urban legends surrounding the game. The legend states that the game popped up mysteriously in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon, where it would be checked up on by men in black that collected data from the machine and reported it back to the FBI. The game was described as popular to the point of addiction and players were reported to suffer from seizures, amnesia, insomnia, night terrors, and hallucinations. Eventually, after a month, all of the arcade machines were recalled without a trace. There's not much to say about this one that isn't already said in the song. The fourth track, No Eyed Girl, is another explicitly told story, where a man falls in love with an interdimensional being. Eventually, when he allows the no-eyed girl in for a kiss, the invasion of the no-eyed people into Earth begins. But given the option, he'd do it all again. Although there isn't much to talk about with this song, it does introduce another running theme throughout the album, and hints at a possible contingency or running story throughout the songs. The line, there's too much light, blinding white. The references to light are a reoccurring motif used in Spirit Phone when humans are talking to Alien. Historically, light represents a superiority, implying that the aliens that visit are biologically or technologically far superior to us. The fifth song on the album, When He Died, delves into the morbid curiosity that people have surrounding deaths. Over-sensationalized deaths due to mysterious circumstances are nothing new. Take Black Dahlia or Elisa Lam, for example. But when he died, looks at these deaths through a satirical lens, telling a hypothetical story of a man who aims to beat and win the competition of mysterious deaths. There's a mention of ritualistic killings through strange symbols on the floor, and the weeping statues are a reference to the phenomenon where statues cry liquid, most commonly seen on the Virgin Mary. Also, we got biblical references! The mention of blood turning the seas red is mentioned in the Book of Revelations, most known for foretelling the apocalypse, most notably in Revelation 16.3. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. This likely ties to the subject of the song's desire to have the most extreme, morbidly fascinating death. And what greater way to do that than to bring upon the end of the world as you die. The painting of the clown in the burning shed is a reference to the crying boy painting. Nearly every house that has owned the crying boy painting burnt down, leaving only the painting unscathed. However, this was reported on by the sun, so t take it as you will. When the painting is turned over, the exact date of his death can be found on the back. This discovery raises the question as to whether this was all planned since he was a child. The sixth song, Sweet Bod, is one that I'm not willing to spend a lot of time on. It's about malification, which is the act of preserving a dead body in honey, and then using that body for medicinal purposes. The guy is doing malification and really trying to persuade people that it's not a kink thing, when it's really heavily implied that it might be a kink thing. Eighth Wonder, not being the eighth track, but the seventh, is about Geff, the talking mongoose a phantom that haunts the Isle of Wight. In the early 1930s, the Irving farm was home to Geff, leading it to get mass attention from British tabloid papers. Eventually, the attention of ghosts and parapsychologists, coolest occupation name by the way, came together and deemed that Geff was a hoax. The song lyrics are quotes from Geff that the Irvings claimed he said, most of which can be found on the Wikipedia page. The seventh song, Ancient Aliens, is most likely based on the TV show with the same name. It's about aliens crash landing onto Earth and communicating with cavemen, 
instructing them to carry out their wants and aiding the progression of humanity, such as discovering fire. Ancient Aliens takes this concept from the perspective of the caveman, and how utterly mind-blown they would be to meet extraterrestrial life. Out of all of the songs, this is my favourite meaning, so bear with me for a while. The song opens with, My mind's this cave, so dark, no moon, no stars. From my understanding, this song acts as an allegory for Plato's cave. Plato's cave, for those who don't know, tells the story of people chained up in a cave, only ever seeing the world through shadows projected onto the wall of the cave, from people passing by a fire higher up. All these people know is the shadows. This is their whole reality. One man escapes and witnesses the real world, and rushes back to tell his peers of the things he's learned and seen beyond their imagination. Those who are chained up laugh and call him insane, because all they've ever known is the flat shadows, and they cannot picture a reality beyond that. This ties into the aliens' appearance to the cavemen, giving these prehistoric humans knowledge that they could not have previously known or imagined. Also, the light motif is used again. You burn my eyes indicating that the aliens are far superior to humanity, and possibly even related to the beings from the No White Girl song. The ninth song, Soft Fuzzy Man, is all about male unrelatability, and acts as a criticism of men who play up this mysterious, nice guy persona to seem more attractive to women. This ties into the linguistic theory that many disagreements and animosity between men and women stem from differences in communication. The difference model suggests that women see socialization as cooperative, whilst men see socialization as competition. Women are more focused on empathy, while men seek solutions, and so on. While this theory is not fact and can definitely be debated, it seems to be the idea that is most cemented in the general population's mind. Awareness of this concept led to the utter pandemic of soft boys, or literally fuzzy men, who Neil criticises for adopting feminine mannerisms or familiar, comforting behaviour to pass themselves off as cooperative and empathetic, when in reality the end goal is sleeping with a woman. The line, I need to feel like I exist, so please baby, please baby, step into the mist, which is the best line delivery on the album, it shows that despite his theatrics of not being like other men, he has the end goal of imprisoning his interests into a typical, unhappy relationship. The concept of men using women as emotional outlets to regulate themselves, or to help them feel like they exist, is something explored by various sociologists. Specifically, this idea makes an appearance in Marxist feminism, where men feel emasculated due to exploitation at work, which links into the following tracks on the album through the very anti-capitalist viewpoints expressed. The tenth track, As Your Father I Expressly Forbid It, is a prelude to I Earn My Life. The song introduces the character of the father by showing an authoritarian and unstable personality. He is depicted as foreboding and irrational, coming off as more threatening than anything else, especially as the song goes on. By using imperative verbs, he creates a commanding demeanour towards his child, and it's only in the next song, I Earn My Life, where we find out the root of this issue. And in track 11, it's capitalism. I Earn My Life is just about capitalism. Neil explained in the commentary track, it's all the mantras he repeats to himself, to explain why he's such an asshole. He doesn't know how to not be afraid, so he channels it into unpleasant behaviour and decides that it's a virtue. So there is a sympathetic guy here, but he's buried under some really difficult layers. These songs are not inspired by anyone I know. They are just imagining someone who is ruled by their emotions that everyone gets to some degree. The lyric, I'm standing on a chair, is a clear allusion to suicide by hanging. Yet even in the act of taking his own life, he forces himself to be self-assured. He moves on to state, I tell it to my wife, showing that his desire for authority and control extends not only just to his child, but to his wife. With, I wouldn't be so worried if I wasn't always right. It demonstrates his panic about not being able to provide, causing him anxiety. Fortune telling is a cognitive distortion in which you predict a negative outcome without realistically considering the actual odds of that outcome. It's linked to anxiety and depression, and is one of the most common cognitive distortions. The father is having fantasies of his own death in verse 2, common in people who are mentally unwell. The overarching theme of suffering under capitalism is driven home by the line, utilities and mortgage are all that will survive, showing his awareness that everything that causes his turmoil will inevitably outlast him and defeat him. Alternatively, all his economic strife will be inherited by his family once he kills himself. It burns too bright, and what have I done to earn this life, 
seems like his last thoughts as he passes, implying that he has at least attempted to kill himself. The twelfth song, Reaganomics, is a satire on the 40th president, Ronald Reagan, and his economic policies. Reaganomics in the real world is a system characterized by low taxes, minimum welfare, monetization, and a reduction in government regulation, so basically a neoliberal's wet dream. In the song, Reagan constantly makes large, sweeping remarks about how great he is and how he's going to save the country, contrary to how his presidential terms played out. The track samples Reagan's inauguration speech in 1981, stating that, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. However, Neil edited the quote to be more nonsensical, though he claims that it was pretty nonsensical to begin with. The 13th song, Man Made Object, is a close-up to the string of capitalism-related songs, and the most underrated track on this entire album. Man Made Object tells the story of an excessively rich man battling the compulsion to build a massive structure. With Reaganomics in mind, the character in this song acts as a foil to the father from I Earn My Life, where the father obviously suffered the realistic consequences of trickle-down economics. This man fills the role of the bourgeoisie, with so much money that he just doesn't know what to do with it, except pour it into bizarre compulsions. Alongside this, the song could tie into the themes of the paranormal, possessing him to create monoliths for a higher entity. This form of possession can be similar to the Jekyll and Hyde situation, as shown by the line, I'm an altogether different man by day, I have the influence to send that man far away. As far-fetched as it seems, it's a common theory people use to explain the constructions of ancient buildings such as the pyramids or Stonehenge. The conspiracy theory states that these structures were created under the command of an alien race or an extraterrestrial being. Finally, the 14th and closing track of Spirit Phone is Spiral of Ants, which serves as a summary of all the themes, concepts, and overarching messages in the album. All of this is neatly summed up in the extended metaphor of an ant mill, or an ant death circle. For those unaware, ant mills are a phenomenon where ants who are following each other's pheromones will end up confused and disorientated. With no sense of direction from their peers, mass amounts of ants will simply trail one another in a circle until they all die of exhaustion. Now, the circle of ants could be a representation of society, being a closed loop itself, where everyone feels obligated to fit in until we die, leaving only our utilities and our mortgages. Our need to contribute and participate in the rules set out by others is, essentially, our undoing. Rings and circles, such as those created by the death spiral, are often associated with infinity, or our tasks being carried out eternally. An iconic example of this would be the Ouroboros, the serpent consuming its own tail. As mentioned before, this song flows seamlessly into Lifetime Achievement Award, creating a infinite spiral of spirit phone. So that was spirit phone. I've had this script for so long, so I'm, I'm really glad that I finally got this recorded and edited and out to you. I haven't edited it yet, but when you're, when you're hearing this, it would have been. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. It helps out the channel massively. We're so close to 500 subs. It would be great if you did. If you want a TLDR on the album, Ghost Good, Capitalism Bad. I have been Unijoy.